Hi, this is Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with visual aids about statistics in everyday life. I'm Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I will be your guide on this nerdy numerical journey. With me today, in his eternal voluntary torment, is Bart. How's it going? I'm good. Um, I'm he and him, and since last episode I've read every article in the Western press, and I now think we need to reinvade Afghanistan uh, <laughs> oh, for yes. a thousand year empire to protect women's rights, because the US is really good at that. Mm, yes, as demonstrated <laughs> in Texas at the moment. Indeed. They're doing such an outstanding job. <laughs> it was only a matter of time before that happened again. Oh yeah. Speaking of political adventures, today we're going to be talking about the census through the lens of some example questions and a bit of history. I want to tell you about some ways that census questions are politically constructed, how that affects vulnerable groups in society, and then look at a historical case of who gets counted and why. Because the census is fundamentally a government instrument, this is really about how the state relates to the people that it has power over. If you're listening to this and you've never worked with census data, chances are your interaction with your local census is a government form you fill out every five years or so, and the government threatens to fine you if you don't fill it out or if you lie. That data goes on to inform basically every policy decision governments make, notionally at least, as well as being used by a whole lot of other organisations including non-government organisations, companies, universities and schools. A census is particularly useful if you want to be as certain as possible that you have data for almost everyone rather than relying on a small part of your population and trying to extrapolate from that to the rest. So this can be particularly difficult in one of the examples that we're going to talk about, if you have a vulnerable population who have never really been counted in the census, getting data on them can be quite difficult because you have to rely on other ways of surveying those people and then kind of say, okay, we've got this small number of them that we've talked to, how do we get information about the bigger number of them that we didn't talk to in a reasonable fashion? It's very, very hard. Yeah. So it's... um. Yeah, if, if the questions are constructed in a way that excludes a particular group, that can that means that the data you have for that group is extrapolated and is well, less accurate in a sense. If you have other data for that group, you have to um, rely on something that is less complete. Yeah. Yeah. So that can make it very difficult to do things like make public health policy decisions if you have a group who need additional public health support or housing support or something like that. Yeah. And of course, a census is political, though it's a founding principle of this podcast that basically any statistic is political in some form. The questions that are or are not asked, how they are asked, and who actually gets to answer change not only what you can determine from the census data, but whether people are willing to respond to it at all. We're going to look at three case studies. The first one is the proposed and actual qu questions for the Australian 2021 census that's just happened a few weeks ago. Yep. And this is about uh, diverse genders and sexualities. We're also going to look at a proposed question for the US census in 2020 on citizenship. Yep. And third, we're going to look at the Australian 1967 referendum, which was the first time that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people were to be counted in the census. That's one of the things that the referendum was about. Yeah. First, Australia 2021. At time of recording, census ran a few weeks ago on the 10th of August. There's a consultation period before the census is run where people can submit comments to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the ABS, about what questions should or should not be in the census. This time around there was a huge push by LGBTIQA plus people and advocacy groups to get questions about gender identity, sex characteristics and sexuality included. The campaign was called Count Us In. Historically, there has been a single question on sex with male and female answers only and no question about sexuality. So this is one of those cases where to get data on this population, people have had to rely on other sources. 
and that's yes. made it very, very difficult to get good data. Quite literally, we don't know how much of the population of Australia has diverse genders or sexualities. We have some rough estimates of between like 10-15% for people in this group overall, but that's that's not a good statistic in the sense that we can do better, we have the tools to do better, but for political reasons we have not. Yes. There have been a lot of smaller surveys, but these are difficult to analyse in a way which can give estimates for the whole population, because who answers them is what we call a convenience sample most of the time. You advertise your survey as widely as your budget allows, you take as many people who answer. But this means that the people who are in your survey have seen your advertisement of some form and have been able and willing to take the time and potentially, if you're talking about a vulnerable pa uh, population, take the risk to actually respond to it. Yes. So, yeah, your results wind up being biased and miss a chunk of people who may otherwise be included in the population. Yes. It's just not representative. And that makes it, as I said, really, really hard to develop public policy in order to incorporate these people. Especially and, when it comes to things like uh, regional assistance and things like that, which would likely be excluded in those um, demographics of that yeah, like convenience but, survey. Yeah, and like there's, there's far better data on, for example, the out gay community in Sydney than there are on trans people living in remote Australia. Yes. There are two sides to the problem of what has actually been asked, how it was asked, and what is being done with the data. We'll start with the first. We wound up with this in the census, a single question about sex. There was no question about sexuality. There wasn't even really a question about gender. We're going to talk about that detail when yeah. we get to it. For those of you enduring the audio-only version, the question asks if a person is male or female. You can only choose one, but there is this link here. There is a link which says, if these options do not describe the person, they can select something other than male and female. The question is mandatory. If this link is clicked, the question has three options, male, female, or non-binary sex. If you tick the non-binary sex, you also have a text field where you can put in more detail. And you can choose more than one. Oh, you can choose more than one gender in that. Uh, yeah, in that I, I'm going to use, I am going to use the term sex here rather than gender because and for clarification these are not usually treated as interchangeable and this is one of the problems with how the question is constructed right yeah so the first problem with co this construction is it treats non-binary people as a different sort of classification hidden from most and that's just discriminatory yes second problem what it asks is wrong so the description that the ABS gives for a person's sex is that it is based on sex characteristics such as their chromosomes, hormones, and reproductive organs. So really, this is about intersex physiology more than it is about non-binary people. Yes. And it's also really not clear what somebody who is trans and is in the process of transitioning or has transitioned should say. Yes. No, I was thinking that because... Uh, yeah. If you are, yeah, if so, you are a, a binary trans person, it would not be because it would be your gender, but not your sex, and so it's not super laid out in how that. It's not. Works. It's very, very badly structured, and even if you are a binary trans person, because they include hormones, you're really stuck. Are you considered non-binary sex if you are undergoing hormone therapy but have not? had other forms of transition, like are not con considering surgery or something like that. Yeah. It's just kind of screwed up. And this is quite deliberate. Like they, there are people in the ABS who know how to do this properly, but they were told not to effectively. Yeah. This is better than just having male or female. There is at least a third option. This is in no small part because we, in Australia, we have legal recognition of non-binary sex for passports and things, yeah. but this doesn't differentiate cis, binary trans, non-binary trans, or intersex people in the way that it could. Yes. And its definition of sex, as we said, is not the same as gender. It's not the same as what people experience, and it doesn't properly reflect even the, the known physiology. 
Yes. Fun note here, by the way. They mention explicitly chromosomes and reproductive organs. But what people know most of the time is actually their external sex characteristics, not their internal ones and not their chromosomes. I know very, very few people who actually know what their chromosomes are, and that's not the only way that intersex physiology manifests. Yes. So realistically, vast majority of people don't know the true, in quotation marks, as in medically uh, accurate according to the description that the ABS provides for this question, they don't know the answer for their own physiology because they will never have had any reason to go and get their hormones tested or go and have a look or whether or not they have supplementary sex organs that are internal. This does happen. This is one of the ways that intersex physiology manifests. And it's not uncommon for people to find out that they are intersex as adults. Yeah if they find out at all. One key example of this is that there is a documented case of a woman with XY chromosomes who has otherwise cis female physiology to the point that she had a daughter also with XY chromosomes and they only found out about this mismatch when the daughter had fertility problems and went to a fertility clinic and this is when they found out that there was this uh, like XY chromosome situation going on in that family. Yeah. And that means, realistically, this question is just complete bullshit. Nobody, unless they have gone through extensive testing, would actually know the true answer to this. You can guess, right? Yeah. Most people will have cis physiology, but you don't know for certain for any individual person. And also it's that... That definition is not listed when you read the question either, so... No, so there's a help sheet that you can find that goes alongside the census that tells you this sort of detail. Yeah. You do have to go looking, of course. And one of the most screwed up things about this, although I doubt anybody is going to be caught out because the ABS doesn't want that kind of um, notoriety, but the legal uh, penalties, you can be fined for lying on your census form, theoretically. So you could theoretically be lied, sorry, be fined for putting down an answer to this, which is accurate to your experience, but doesn't reflect what, uh, let's say, some ministers in our conservative government consider. Yeah. Wait, if you can be fined for... You can be fined for, fined lying, for lying on the, on census. the census. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't that mean that the census is not anonymous? Well, the census is anonymous to the published data nominally, and we'll talk about that in a second, it is not anonymous to the ABS because oh. you put your name and your address on it. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the kind of subtle distinction between where that anonymity lies. The data that the ABS publishes is, has been de-identified. Your name and address are not attached to it anymore once it goes out to the public. Yeah. But that data is still collected. It's why you put your name in. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Hmm, I can see some problems with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it's a serious question. And uh, privacy issues around the census are huge. We'll talk about one when we talk about what is done with this um, non-binary sex response. Yeah. But in general, like, there are, reason there are quite justifiable reasons that people choose not to complete the census because they think that the government is going to use it against them. Yeah. And historically, this is justified because census data has been used to target populations in the past. Not such a big thing in Australia, but in our American example, we're going to discuss that. Yes. For the moment, we can do better than this question, but we have to be a little bit careful about how we do it. So if we want to talk about gender experience rather than sex, because they, they are subtly different in that if you want to talk about sex as physiology, you go into a whole bunch of complex stuff and people don't really know. But people know their gender, yes. right? You can ask somebody and they will be able to tell you, even if that answer is, oh, I don't know, not this, I guess? Yeah. Which does happen, with in, particularly in non-binary people. What it looks like can vary, but people generally have a fairly good idea. Yeah. So my first question I would ask, is this person male, female, non-binary, and I would not include sex there, other, and you would be able to like fill in some text there. Yeah. So this would be a tick all that apply. Yep. And the reason to have male, female, non-binary, and other this is not an exhaustive list. 
I imagine you would get some agender or gender fluid people potentially putting stuff in the other, and this is why you have that box there as an option. Yeah. But male, female, and non-binary is a generally reasonable first classification system and aligns with the uh, legally recognised genders in Australia. Yeah. But wouldn't that still exclude uh, binary trans people? No, it doesn't. Because this is the gender. And in the description, this would be your gender. Yeah. The reason that this would not exclude uh, trans people is that there would be another question, which is, is the person's gender the same as the sex they were registered at birth? Ah. Oh, and in the um, description of this question, I would specify that this one here is about gender. Yes. So this second question allows you to differentiate cis people from trans people. Yes. No, that the second question answered my first question. <laughs> yeah, but there it, and this would be a yes or no. Yeah. This does have a slight wrinkle in that intersex people may not be properly dealt with in this. So you have a third question. Is the person known to be intersex? And then you would have yes, no. Yeah. These would all be voluntary as well. Yes. Because, yeah, you don't. You, I am not comfortable with the idea of making these mandatory questions in a census. Most people will still answer it, but you need to give them the choice. Yeah. When you don't want to out someone. Um, yeah. Or have any so risk this... of someone being outed, I guess, is the... Yeah, well, that's always a problem, right? Because if you have somebody living in an environment where they cannot, well, I mean, particularly this is an issue with filling in the census privately if you have roommates, for example. Yeah. You, there are questions around how private that information can be within a household. And if you're not out to the people you live with, it can be quite dangerous. Yes. So this structure here allows us to separate out the gender identity that people have from what they were assigned at birth, which gives us our trans cis identification. Potentially, I, I don't, these would not be final, right? I am not an expert on this and other than my own experience. And I think that this is the sort of thing you would take to consultation with people in this group. There has been a lot of efforts, like the Countess in campaign involved a lot of dealing with activists and working out what a good structure for this sort of thing would be. Yes. And that's a necessary part of the consultation progress that the ABS was just not allowed to do for political reasons, basically. Yeah. For sexualities, uh, despite Kaudasin, there was no question on the census about sexuality. So we can criticise its absence as an effort to hide the, hide the true population of people who aren't straight in the country. There are efforts to infer some of that from census data on the reported sex of one's partner. So if I say I am female and my and I say this person is my partner who is also female, you can tell that, that is a same sex relationship. Yeah. But that underrepresents the true number of people who are in or who are same sex attracted or in same sex relationships because they may not live together. Yes. And uh, I don't know. Like I'm bi, so I wouldn't be counted under that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I right and more. nominally i would show up as in a heterosexual relationship because i i put down female and non-binary which because of the way that they are releasing this data would look like just female and my partner is male yes so i look on the census like heterosexual but i'm not straight so this um, underrepresentation is a real problem and it's infuriating <laughs> <laughs> because you just don't have the data there to make good policy decisions yes so how I would do the sexualities question is basically to have a list and people can tick one or more than one. They're encouraged, they would be encouraged to tick the one that best applies to them. What actually goes on that list would need to be subject of consultation. What I would do as an initial proposal is straight, heterosexual, gay, homosexual, lesbian, homosexual, bisexual, pansexual, asexual, and some num potential number of others because there's a huge variety of different options there which may or may not be interchangeable like whether or not pansexual and bisexual actually mean the same thing is contentious yes 
so I'm not going to claim that's a definitive list. And that is something that you would talk to people and say, what would you like there to be here to represent what you experience? Yes. Because you can do that. And indeed, you should do that. I mentioned that how data are reported on is also a consideration. So the ABS has said that there will be a special report on people who selected a non-binary option which gives information on that population. But when those people are included in reporting for everyone, they will instead be assigned a binary gender rather than being shown as a non-binary person in the general population. Why? For the we'll get to this, but for the purpose of most ABS statistics and reporting, binary non-binary people won't exist. So there are good and bad reasons to randomly assign a binary gender. We call it imputation, where you either uh, have a missing data or you treat something as missing data. Yeah. So the good reason, you are protecting the privacy of a small and potentially very vulnerable population by preventing them being individually identified in your published data. Yes. What I mean by that is the ABS publishes data which allows you to get the number of people who fall into some combination of characteristics. So if I want to know how many people over 35 living in, say, Richmond earn above $80,000 a year, I can find that out, like, just as a number of people. The statistical tool is called a cross-tabulation, and the sort of data you get out of it looks something like this. This is a cross-tabulation with two variables. We have out here age groups. Yep. And you can see we go from 15 to 24 to 85 years and over. Yes. So these columns represent the number of people. I've, I've blacked out the postcode, but there is a postcode. Yes. That this is associated with. The number of people in this postcode in each of these groups. Down here, this number is the total number of people 15 to 24 years old living in this postcode. Yes. Our row variable here is level of education. So that's that's listed here. All right, right. Now. It's a bit <laughs> yeah, long. fair. Right. Um, so we have two variables, level of education and age. So this by sex bit is because there are other tables which also split this by male and female. Yes. But what we can see here is that the total number of people in this postcode with a postgraduate degree is 527. Yeah. But, well, I've, I've not picked a particularly good cell for this, but oh well. So the number of people in this postcode who are 15 to 24 and have a postgraduate degree is zero. Yes. So that uh, it's a cross tabulation because it allows us to see the intersection of those groups. Wait, what do you mean by the intersection of those groups? As in this this number here represents the people who are both postgraduates and fifteen to twenty four. Oh, okay, yes. So both of those conditions apply. Yeah. This number, one hundred and five, is the people who are twenty five to thirty four and have a postgraduate degree qualification. Yes. Where this gets tricky is when you have a small number of people. So if we look at this three here, for example. Yes. So that means. If I know a person who is 85 years and older, because that's this variable here, and has a graduate diploma and graduate uh, certificate level here, I know one of the people in this cell. Yeah. And if I know they are male or female, and then I look at this data by sex, there may be just one person there. Yes. And if I then look at it by sex and by income, I can potentially work out what the reported income of this person was based on those other characteristics. Ah, uh, yes, I understand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And this gets way riskier if you have a population who is already small. So if you've got like three people who identified as non-binary in your postcode and they're different age groups, you can work out a hell of a lot of other potentially quite private information about those people based on this. Yes. This makes it very difficult for the ABS to deal with those small population groups within a bigger population and still protect their privacy. Yes. I will, I'm going to like point to this line down here, which says 
Please note there are small random adjustments made to all cell values to protect the confidentiality of data. These adjustments may cause the sum of rows or columns to differ by a small amount from table totals. What that basically means is there is a statistically rigorous way to slightly adjust the numbers in these cells, which means that you are less able to identify individuals, but does not change the like summary data that you get out in these totals. Yes. So the statistics of this is really, really fascinating. I'm not an expert in any way on it, but I know some people who are working in this field. And a lot of the concern that they have is for these vulnerable populations who can be identified otherwise. Yeah, it's uh, quite easy to reverse engineer who exactly someone is if they're in a small population. If, if you have some amount of information, yes. yeah. And this, like, this stuff is very publicly available. I went to the ABS website, which I encourage people to do, by the way, if they're interested. Uh, I went to a community profile for this postcode, and I looked up their, just download an Excel spreadsheet and walked through the tables that they provide. It's interesting to do, but you need to be aware of some of the limitations of it, one of which is that in this new data that's coming out, non-binary people will not be reported in the sex variable in these. Yes. That's the good reason to not report non-binary people or to have like a invented gender for them. Yeah. The bad reason, of course, is to make it harder for people with diverse genders and, and sexes and physiologies, because the question was bad, to advocate for themselves by making it difficult for the data to access and yes. use. I don't think that the people at the ABS want that to be the case. Well, at least not not as a whole. There's probably a couple of people there because, I mean, chances are there are, yeah. right? But certainly it is a concerted effort by our government to make it more difficult for people to for people in these groups to advocate for themselves. Yeah. The other thing I could say is a logistics issue as well, right? Because for in if you're relying on these on this data for hospitals and what they should stock for example um that uh things that are supplied to uh non-binary people in terms of hormones and stuff it it's yes. kind of going to be harder to make estimations as to what is necessary in that situation yep so in general medical support for non-cis people is pretty garbage yep. like there's a lot of deeply transfer uh, transphobic doctors and structures within the medical system I mean, cis women don't have a great time of it either, but it's worse for people who are not yes. cis. And it gets really, really difficult. There are healthcare support for trans people has some slightly better structure in the sense that because transitioning can be quite intensely medical, they need and have been building for generations now medical support within that. But the interface between that and the access uh, between that and the broader healthcare system and the access to that in the first place are not great. Yes. And uh, it's almost like if you had better population data on trans and non-binary non-binary and intersex people in general, you might be able to provide better healthcare for yeah. them. Yeah, no, that's what I was thinking. Con <laughs> the other big policy area um, that I see affected by this is housing. Yes, because. LGBTIQA people in general have higher rates of homelessness, higher rates of poverty than the rest of the population. And quite often, um, I mean, so in, in Australia, the Salvation Army are notorious for discriminating against these uh, against yes. people on the basis of their gender or their sexuality. And they are one of the larger housing in, um, groups out there. I mean, public housing in Australia has been in decline for a very, very long time ever since the government stopped building it and started selling it off to private companies. So that is... Yeah, we lost, <laughs> we lost the class struggle 40 years ago. <laughs> it's very depressing, <laughs> isn't it? So like th this group who are particularly vulnerable in their housing are also have a harder time accessing it because the policy doesn't take into account that aspect of their yes. lives, basically. In terms of the politics, this is really a way of oppressing people through making them invisible. Yes. If you have pretended, and whether or not people in the government actually believe this, for a very long time that the population of people for whom, like, same-sex marriage, trans rights, or, like, 
intersex medical care are an issue is tiny and hence irrelevant in air quotes or that it's basically a couple of loud weirdos and nobody else really cares about it it becomes much easier for a conservative government to push their agenda to exclude us yes having access to good census data on the size of the population makes that much much harder because all of a sudden you you might see oh this affects maybe 15 to 20 percent of the population that's not small and even like even if it is a small in quotation marks proportion of your population that doesn't mean it's a small number of people yes this is something that shows up all over the place because people think that a tiny in quotation marks population makes something a fringe issue but percentages scale in terms of real number with the population size so when bigots are cynically utilitarian it is often useful to remind them that actual numbers are, are behind these. The best estimate that I've seen of the population of intersex people in the world is one to one and a half percent. Yes. Right? So if we say here, but one, ooh, hang on, my pen's getting funny, 1.5% intersex. What does that mean in terms of actual numbers? Well, in Australia, we have 25 million people. And to work out what 1.5% of that is, we multiply it by 0 0.015, which is 37, three, sorry, 335,000 people. Yeah. That's not a small number no, of people. That's, <laughs> that's bigger than most cities yeah. in Australia, right? Globally, 1.5% of the population is 118 million yes. people. Roughly, right? So all of a sudden, this supposedly fringe or tiny population of people who need different sorts of medical care because they are intersex rather than like, I guess cis would be the correct word for yeah. that. That's a much bigger population than people anticipate when you actually look at it on yeah. this scale. Also, the thing, the thing to point that, out politically with any bigot who um, is making that utilitarian argument, I guarantee they have at least one belief that's completely crank and unpopular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right or, or even if it's not a yeah. belief they, there is some aspect of their life history or their health history which is equally uncommon in the general yes. population let's move on from this example which is australia this year where a marginalized group has been advocating to be counted in a manner of their choosing to the u.s question on citizenship status where a government tried to use the census as an avenue to hurt migrants and refugees living in the United States. This didn't actually go through, but it was something to be imposed upon a vulnerable group from a government that is known to be hostile, violent even, towards undocumented migrants and even documented ones yes. in many respects. So here is the proposed question for the 2020 census. Is this person a citizen of the United States? There are four different options for yes, based on whether they were born in the United States mainland, born in one of the territories, born abroad, or naturalized. Yeah. And there is one option for no. So structurally, this doesn't distinguish between non-citizens. Nominally, this could give undocumented people protection because they can't be identified by this. Yes. Practically, it means that documented migrants, tourists, whatever, will be tarred with the same brush as undocumented people by those trying to use this data maliciously. Because that's just yeah. what happens, right? So if you have, like, 100,000 people in your city who answer, no, not a US citizen, those who wish to use this data to discriminate will say, there's 100,000 potentially undocumented people in this city. Yes. And that is a problem. So the primary impact of a question like this is that people who feel like it threatens their safety won't participate in the census. I can't blame them. I wouldn't if I thought that it was going to be used to yeah, do me not. harm. The push for this came from Trump's Justice Department, and of course the man himself was tweeting about it in a way which implied that it could be used to harm. He said that the American people deserve to know who is in this country. American in this case, of course, excludes non-citizens. Yes. Uh... The veneer put over this was that it was necessary in order to determine the population of eligible voters, who are necessarily citizens. 
but a whole bunch of documentation came out, like internal documents, came out afterwards giving more evidence to the idea that that was very much a veneer. Yes. The flow-on effect of people not answering the census are that you don't count the full number of people. So allocation of resources based on census data underestimates how much those communities need. If this question was asked, non-citizens wind up stuck behind a rock in a hard place. If they answer, they may be targeted personally, or their community may be discriminated against because it has more non-citizens. If they don't, their community is likely to be under-resourced for years because the census doesn't reflect the true population size. Either way, you're that kind of That seems like a goal of the question as well, though. Oh, absolutely. And this is, this is one of those times where there is a very, very obvious political agenda at play. It's very infuriating, and I'm glad that it wasn't included in the end. But the way that the census preparation works is that you take out like trial form. So you, you, you put together a questionnaire that is more or less what you think the census is going to look like. You go and you talk to a thousand people, you get them to fill it out. You see what it looks, you see what answers yeah. come back, right? That process, I believe I, I read a report that some had been printed and tested that had this citizenship question on yes. them. The people who saw that question on the trial questionnaire may or may not feel oh my god i can't answer the actual census oh my god i can't participate in this because it's a threat yes. to me even though it did not get on the final form it may have had an impact yes and we won't know that because you can't you can potentially estimate some aspects of non-participation but it's very very hard because you don't have the data in front yes. of you yes Obviously deliberate and very, um, <laughs> let's, let's sure. go with that. Lastly, let's talk about the 1967 referendum in Australia. Because we are a settler colonial society, one of the ways that the colonial government excluded and tried to eliminate the traditional owners, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, was to behave as though they were not people, and particularly not people subject to the power of the Australian state which is some bullshit because, you know, the Australian state was stealing their land, genociding their populations. Yeah, they, they were subject to that yeah. power, right? In the early days, they relied on so, Aboriginal labour a lot as well. Oh, they did for a very long time. I mean, people who say that there was no slavery in Australia uh, is an ahistorical claim because we simply forced Aboriginal people to work for us after stealing yes. all their land and didn't pay them. <laughs> So I'm not sure what classification of slavery you would have that wouldn't include Oh, and that. let's not forget Queensland stealing a bunch of people from Papua New Guinea either. <laughs> oh, yes. So blackbirding uh, was the practice whereby um, P Pacific Islanders and people from like our northern neighbours would basically be uh, coerced into becoming indentured yes. farm workers. And that happened for a long time. We still exploit migrant labour to hell and back in our um, yeah, farming. Yeah, absolutely which is becoming particularly problematic under COVID because nobody's getting in to do it. And of course, actually paying people a reasonable wage to do the work is just yeah, intolerable. Absolutely. So anyway, the exclusion of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people from the census was a tool of genocide. They weren't counted in the population and the federal government was not legally allowed to make laws to support them. The referendum was aimed at including Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders in the population of Australia and rectifying yes. that in general. So here is the wording of the question. I apologise in advance for how this is worded, but it's a government thing. Do you approve the proposed law for the alteration of the constitution, because it was a referendum to change the constitution, entitled an act to alter the constitution so as to omit certain words relating to the people of the Aboriginal race in any state and so that the Aboriginals are to be counted in the reckoning of the population. I apologise for the language that uses. It was a, uh, unfortunately a little bit uh, weird at the time. In practice, this meant that the federal government would be able to make laws regarding Indigenous people as part of the general population and they would be counted in the census. So this is another example of people who are advocating for themselves to be counted in the census because they will benefit from it. And a government which had explicitly used the census as a tool of oppression by excluding people from it in some way. Unlike the sexualities and genders question, this is not 
just hiding that aspect of their lives. This was about saying, oh no, this population cannot even participate yes. at all. So that's our three examples. Any questions? <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> I don't like the information I've learned, but um, I was going to say with the, um, the American example as well, there is precedent in America for census data being used to round up populations. During World War II, the... Um, the Japanese Americans yeah. were rounded up using census data yep. explicitly. So there is precedent there for it. Like, oh, yeah. It's not. There's, there's very good reason for people to be afraid yes. of this, which is doubly a reason why it was seen as a viable tool to use by the Trump yes. administration. Because I have no doubt that the people who put this in did so knowing that history of the Japanese internment Absolutely. camps. And knowing, yeah. Because. They're those kind of people, mm. right? <laughs> Charming. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, though. Is it better now that we have Joe Biden, who's building more concentration camps, but seems a bit nicer about it? Oh, they're like, not concentration it's... camps. <laughs> they're not camp. They're not in tents. They're in buildings now. <laughs> yeah, it's e either way, yeah. it's pretty screwed up. And later at some point, I think I want to talk about um, a couple of historical examples where stuff like census has stuff stuff like the census has been used as as a tool of resistance against colonial governments because it has been there's like india is the primary example that springs yeah. to my mind because uh like during the bengali famine efforts to see how many people were actually dying were stymied by the british colonial government trying to pretend that there wasn't actually millions yes. of them dying but that is the topic for another episode yeah sure for on now, our, though, <laughs> on our cheery mailbag. genocide episode. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's going to be more than one of those. We have a mailbag segment on this podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about a chart that several people showed to me back in June because, oh boy, is it a good one. All right, let's go. Sorry for the, uh, like, this black box in the middle here. This is what happens when you get your yeah. material on Twitter. <laughs> the actual he the header from this, this is from a CNN news story in June. The headline of this particular slide is violent crime is a very big problem. This came from a segment on violent crime, so, uh, an alleged spike in violent crime rates in US cities. I think uh, this was particularly New York and Chicago it was talking about. Yeah. But there are a few problems with this particular chart being used for that argument. So first off, this violent crime is a very big problem is a question that was on a survey the Pew Research Center put out. So these numbers here, these percentages, are the percentage of respondents to that survey who said, yes, violent crime is a yeah. very big problem. It has nothing to do with the actual incidence no, of, of violent crime. This is about the perception of it, right? And we will, we will do an episode in, in the future at some point, <laughs> I keep promising these, about, uh, whoopsie, about crime statistics. But this is not actually crime statistics, right? This is about people's perception. And it turns out when you talk about crime a whole bunch, people think that there's more yes. violent crime. So this, using it like this, because 50%, which is roughly what this is, right? It, you think, oh, that's a large number of the population. 50%, that's huge, right? But that just means about half the people think it's a big problem. This is manufacturing consent yes. for policing, is what this segment is really about. So that's the first problem. The data that is presented is only tangentially related to the what the supposed new yes. segment is about. Secondly, have a look at this x-axis here. So normally, when we have an x-axis representing time, the early time is on the left, and the later time is on the right. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. So in this case, the left-hand point <laughs> is the late time, and the right-hand point is the early time, so it's backwards. Oh, incredible. Now look at that, and then look at that line. Suddenly it doesn't look like it's going up so much, does it? <laughs> in fact, the mirror image looks like this. What this actually looks like is, this is 2020, yeah. it was a low point, but you've got maybe a general downward trend here, and a particularly low yes. year in 2020. This is backwards, but this is a 3% error margin, which means that 52% and 49% are within that 3% error of each other, so you couldn't yeah. really distinguish them. And the 49, 48% are, again, within that error margin. So this may or may not be a yes. trend at all. 
We'll go back up to here because it's more legible. There is another problem with this x-axis. There's five months between March 2019. Uh, I use a different colour. So this is five yeah. months. This was 10. Oh, sorry. Not 10. 15 months. And this was 10 yeah. months. Despite these being positioned like they are equal distance on this backwards x-axis, they're actually not. And that means the actual shape of this is much less dramatic than it appears. Because as this is drawn, it looks like this here is the same length of time as that. Yeah. And it's not. You know, it's three times as long. The x-axis on this plot is backwards and uneven. Yes. Which is just dishonest. I know that some guides on this sort of thing so there are a whole bunch of like videos on the internet and written guides and things for look analyzing news charts and some will say that a y-axis which doesn't start at zero is misleading this one the lowest value represented yeah. here is 35 percent the highest value is 55 percent so that means if you're not paying attention the vertical distances look like a bigger impact yes. than they actually are i don't necessarily agree that this is always misleading because it's only misleading if you don't show the numbers and all the numbers are here it's just that they're presented yes. in a dishonest way um because like like if you because if, you, if this was a more sorry. reasonable thing you'd be trying to show the different differentiation not actually show the raw number itself right well yeah but like uh, provided the numbers are there yeah you have to be really really careful with it it can be used in a misleading way and it is more likely to be misleading if you yeah. haven't put the numbers there if you have put the numbers there and what you're trying to do is show for whatever reason some variation within a range i think that's quite reasonable like if you have something where a 10 percent difference really is large like oh i don't know blood oxygenation in a patient during yeah. who's suffering from COVID, for example 10 percent drop is large in that but a 10 percent drop elsewhere or a five percent drop elsewhere may yeah. not be significant so you have to be or, sorry i should be careful using the word significant let's say it may not be large so you have to be a bit judicious in what you are presenting and the reader should absolutely look at the y-axis and if the numbers aren't there be very very careful and think it's probably yes. there for a reason to mislead you if the numbers are there just have a think about it first i do think that in this case in the context of the other factors like the backwards x-axis this has been made with absolutely. an agenda in order to avoid defamation let's say probably if I was to produce this, it would be with deliberate intent to mislead because otherwise I would have put the x-axis the other way and spaced it out to make the, the, um, yes. the timeline more realistic. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, for legal, purposes, <laughs> for legal purposes, I will say this was potentially done with the intention. But in well, it was certainly... D I don't, I don't think we can say that specifically, but I can think, do think we can say it was done with an intention. <laughs> yes, it was done intentionally. Let's go with that. So the lesson from this is to look for this sort of thing. This is why news stories are so notorious for having really uh, misleading uh, graphs and things. It's because people don't tend to scrutinize charts put on news stories. I mean, they may not be there for long enough to do so. I got a still frame of this, which is why I was able to sit down and go, hang on, there's something <laughs> funny going on here. But that takes time. Like, and it took me some time to work out why my brain was going, no, 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 this is wrong. There's something very wrong here. It took me like a minute of staring at it to go, oh my yeah, God, the X-axis is backwards. Would have <laughs> I was looking at it and just... Yeah, because you don't necessarily look. You see, okay, that's yeah. time, fine. And then it took me another few minutes to work out that there was a the size gap between those x points yeah. was different size and i have <laughs> years of training in this the average person watching the news story or maybe glancing at it every so often they're going to look at this and say oh my god yeah. the crime's going up when it's not even <laughs> about the crime it's about what people think about the yeah, crime yeah. so this as presented in a news story is definitely trying to push an agenda of yes there's more crime so we need more policing that's us done for the episode. 
If you, dear listener, would like us to talk about a statistic or a chart that you have seen, send it to us on Twitter or email us at statisticallyinsignificantpod at protonmail.ch. Both of these are in the description. Thank you, Bart. Thanks, Tess. Have a good one. Have a good one yourself.